Testing, check, one, two. Testing, check, one, two. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I'm Carrie. <laughs> yeah, museum. I'm Carrie Woke. I'm an educator here at the museum, and you may know me from such programs as two years of virtual astronomy days. <laughs> so if you attended those programs, you probably have seen me host a whole bunch of them but I am super excited to be hosting an in-person astronomy event finally at the museum. And what an exciting night this is. We are just so excited to be sh showing these images. I've held off looking at them all day <laughs> so I could just share them with you on the big screen. Um, Hugo and I are wearing our James Webb Space Telescope shirts that we had in, we did the math 2017 is when we pick James Webb Space Telescope to be our theme for Astronomy Days. And look, it's 2022, and finally we're getting those images. So we have an, a really exciting evening of programs planned for you today. So I'm going to start off by introducing your um, other host. So Mike Keefe is a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador and also very active in the Raleigh Astronomy Club. So if you're not familiar, with RAC, please visit the RAC table and learn a little bit more about this amazing organization. They are really fantastic. And Mike has been partnering with the museum for years and years to bring amazing astronomy programs like Astronomy Days, James Webb, Perseverance, Curiosity, <laughs> all these different programs we've done over the years. So please welcome Mike Keefe. Thank, thank you, Carrie. Um, it is fantastic to be here, uh, very exciting. I was not able to um, not look at the photos, so uh, I've been pouring over them, and uh, what an exciting um, release uh, it, that we've seen. Um, we have a very special treat uh, for you all here gathered um, at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Um, this venue plus, I wanna say, uh, dozens uh, more are hosting one of these um, reveal events and only available to those people attending these uh, reveal events is a special uh, expert panel um, that's being live streamed from NASA. So that is going to be coming up uh, almost momentarily, we hope, if the feeds and everything aligns. So uh, we're gonna have four amazing experts um, actually talking about the images that were released this morning. Um, and so they'll do about 10 minutes 
per each uh, image. Uh, and then they'll have some Q and A's that they've been gathering uh, online. So they'll present that. Uh, and then we'll go into some uh, talks we have locally. So um, I don't know if I can get a thumbs up or an okay that the uh, NASA feed is going. So we'll switch over to that. Awesome, thank you. Of our own solar system. So welcome everybody. I know we've all had a really busy day from the unveiling of the first images uh, starting yesterday and then today. And um, we know that it's been really truly exciting for the world to see this. So for our audience that are all over the country right now, so welcome to you all to this event. Uh, we'd like to share with our audience here a little bit about you all. So we're in a very special place in history right now. So I think the audience would be really interested to hear about how you came to get to where we are today. Um, how, you know, for example, you can talk about how you got became a scientist and uh, what did that path look like? So in my screen here, um, I am going to um, uh, have uh, Nicole, why don't you start since you were introduced first? Absolutely. Cool. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I growing up, I was very much into science fiction and I loved um, thinking about where aliens came from and what their home planet was like. So honestly, my love for astronomy started back when I was a teenager and it just moved forward here. And I've since worked on the Kepler mission which started off a revolution in our knowledge of exoplanets and understanding how many are out there. And now it evolved to work on James Webb. And that's where uh, I am today. <laughs> Great, thank you, Nicole. So next, the same question um, to David. Okay, hi. Uh, I guess for me at least then, my interest in astronomy really came about from you know, starting back in high school and starting to you know, study math and physics and everything like that. And I remember the thing that I found just absolutely fascinating was gravity. The fact that we could just write down really simple equations that could tell us about how things in the universe moved. And that was uh, really just incredible to me that you know, we could understand how such you know, complicated things, how so many distant things across the entire size of the universe moved and formed into the things that we could observe in our skies. So that's really what convinced me to study astronomy when I was you know, an undergraduate in college and you know, then go on from there to say, you know, wow, there's so much cool stuff we can study in the universe. And you now galaxies in particular really spoke to me since they're really the building blocks of you know, whatever it is we see in the universe out to the very largest distances. So I've been you know, trying to study them ever since then, all the way from the very nearest galaxies in our own Milky Way out to the very most distant galaxies where we can see the very first things starting to form. Great, thank you very much, David. Uh, next, uh, Stephanie, could you tell us a little bit about your, um, your path towards uh, astronomy and solar system astronomy? Absolutely. Um, so I grew up in Houston, Texas, and when I was six years old, I had a field trip to Johnson Space Center. And I came home from that field trip and I told my parents that I was going to work for NASA someday. Um, my background is actually in chemistry and um, I, I was working in an environmental laboratory and decided that I wanted to take my chemist expertise um, from a, a room washing beakers and running scientific equipment to the entire universe and using telescopes to study chemistry. Um, not only in our own solar system, but also where other solar systems or planetary systems are actually being formed. Uh, so I've been passionate about passionate about the James Webb Space Telescope since I've been working on it um, for over a decade now. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll share my little story. So um, I am also an astronomer and I remember looking um, as a child outside my window in Philadelphia and I saw one object through the window because there was a lot of life pollution in a big city. And I just remember thinking about and looking out my window and, and just wondering what it was. I really thought it was a star. It was actually Jupiter, but still it was something to look at. And um, when I started doing my uh, professional work and research, uh, someone asked me, why do you want to study galaxies? And the first thing that came out of my mouth was, they're just really beautiful. 
and I want to know more. So it could be as simple as that. So for all of you in the audience, uh, young and old, the wonders of the universe can start when you're little. It could start when you're a little bit older. It could start even later. Um, and so wherever that might be, it'll take you many different places. So our event tonight is to really start you on that excitement of wondering about the universe by taking a look at Webb's first images. So if we could uh, go to the next slide, please. We will start off with the first uh, image that was released yesterday. So here we have Webb's first deep field, SMAX 0723. So I'm gonna throw this out to all the speakers and um, could someone tell the audience what we're looking at? And I'm going to just uh, let's see, I'm trying to see, um, I'm going to see hands from the speakers because I okay. can kind of see you virtually here. So we've got David, why don't you start yeah, I'd be off? more than happy to talk about that one. So this I'll one, take a few words, yeah. Yep, this one is a fantastic view at galaxies both near-ish and incredibly far in the sense that we're using sort of nature's telescope to help us look at galaxies in a way beyond where we could ordinarily see them, even with the power of JWST. And the reason why that works is because the gravity and the cluster of galaxies we're looking at, if you look at the center of the image, then you can kind of see a bunch of you know, whitish blobs. Those are helping to define a cluster of galaxies and the gravity from those galaxies is so strong, it's actually bending the light from you know, galaxies at vast distances beyond them and magnifying them so that we can see things further than we'd ordinarily ever be able to see them in the universe. So those arcs, those red streaks that you see in this image, background gal behind the cluster that are getting lensed and warped into these weird shapes and we can you know, see them a lot more easily because they're magnified and study galaxies out to you know incredible distances and of course this field is you know, rich with other galaxies as well with a variety of different distances so there's just an incredible wealth of cosmic time that we can study in an image like this great thank you david i just remembered i did want to remind the host sites this is for the q a that uh the host sites are are uh have access to when you put questions as you're hearing our scientists panel uh, our panel of scientists talk about these first images and there might be questions that come up for the host sites you can drop your questions into our q a um, if you'd like, you can also write down um, where the question is coming from. It's coming from Baltimore, Maryland, for example. Um, and if you really would like to add this to, you can also say it came from Maya, age 15. And so as we look through, um, I have a window over here with the questions and we're, we're going to look through those to uh, ask the, the scientists these questions. Um, for the other panelists, um, can someone talk more about kind of these rays that we're seeing, kind of these rings, these arcs, these lines that kind of look like they're doing this in the image. And Klaus, just so you know, I can't see your feed. So uh, if you want to speak up, you, you'll you just um, need to. Um, but I don't see anybody else's hand. So if someone uh, would like to explain uh, those arcs. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Uh, I think you'll see some of us who are sitting here and <laughs> God, I'm a little bit distracted because there's this crazy thunderstorm going on right now and our lights are flashing and I can't see, I can't see whether three feet out the window because there's just so much rain. <laughs> so <laughs> so if, if we suddenly disappear, uh, it's, it might be a thunderstorm, just so so you're aware. Uh, but with that, I, yeah, I, can, I can talk about the arc. So I, this is one of the things I find really incredibly uh, fascinating about the, this image is that what you see is a wrinkle in space time. The, the this massive galaxy cluster is 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 bending light from distant galaxies behind it, and it's it's uh, when it does that, it creates these these arcs and streaks you see around. So these are actually if the, if the cluster wasn't there, um, these galaxies would be much smaller. They would be much fainter. So what the cluster does is it it both makes distant galaxies appear larger and brighter. And this is something that helps us uh, get a, an, an, an additional boost to our ability to understand this, these very distant galaxies whose light has traveled for more than 13 billion years by using this cluster. So one of the reasons we, we picked it for one of the first images. 
Thank you, Klaus. All right, so let's move on. We have plenty more time for, for questions here, and we'll, we'll keep some of the um, uh, uh, more of the Q&A uh, closer to the end here, and we'll go through the images and then come back here. So if we can move to the next slide. So here we have um, what is uh, called a spectrum um, of the exoplanet WASP 96b. So I think I'm going to throw this over to Nicole to be able to talk about what amazing things that Webb has seen when it took a look at this planet. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so this is exciting. It is the first exoplanet data to come from Webb. And what you're seeing here is not an image, right? It is a spectrum. But what that means is we've broken up the light that has come from the star WASP-96 as it's filtered to, through the planet's atmosphere. And we've broken that down to create this, these data points here that you see all the little white points are data. And what this is showing us um, is that in the atmosphere of this exoplanet, there is water vapor that is absorbing some of the starlight and causing these bumps that you're seeing in the data. And you could see that even without the blue line here, which is a model, um, you could see by eye clear, clearly that there is water in this atmosphere, which is really exciting. And even so, there was a best fit model to indicate that this is just a first look. Um, it's the model, there's going to be more advanced information coming from this, but basically we understand that there's water vapor and that um, there's evidence for hazes and clouds in the atmosphere as well, because the size, the amplitude of the water features are not quite as large as predicted if it was a truly clear, like cloud-free atmosphere. So this is just the beginning. Um, this is a Jupiter-sized planet. Uh, it's very low density, about half the mass of Jupiter. And so we knew that this would be a good target, that it is fluffy, it has a big atmosphere that should contain a lot of water, so it does. So that's great. And now we can move forward from here and start to look at other types of exoplanets ranging down to Earth size planets and start to collect data just like this and across even more wavelength ranges because this covers just a tiny part not a tiny part, but just one part of the infrared. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Um, could you elaborate for the audience, how does uh, the James Webb Space Telescope get this data that we see here? Uh, because you mentioned it's at different kinds of light and certain amounts are bringing out the water. So, so how does that actually happen in the telescope? Right, so this planet, well, 96b is the planet name. Um, this is what we call a transiting exoplanet. Um, so there, what we see actually is an indirect effect. We look at a, the star and we measure how the brightness changes over time. And with that, we'll see a big dip in the brightness as the planet passes in front and blocks some light. But then what we can do is take that exact light and break it down because as the planet passes in front of the star, the planet has an atmosphere around it. So the atmosphere also passes in front of the star. And so with that, we can break down into spectroscopy um, as you see here. And so um, there is a, a, a light curve of this, as we call it, of the planet passing in front of the star, um, which we can come back to later um, as well. But that's how we get there. Or I think we're trying to move there now. So. <laughs> right, Travis, you moved to slide 13. That should be the slide that Nicole is referencing. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so you can see how beautiful this is just um, what we call if, uh, just a white light curve. So if you just took all the light collected from um, the nearest instrument in particular, you just measure the brightness over that entire wavelength range in the infrared, you will see before the planet passes in front of the star, it's just flat. It's just measuring the starlight, and then the planet passes in front, the starlight gets blocked, but the planet has an atmosphere, so that actually blocks the extra light, and that's what causes those bumps and wiggles when you break it down. And apologies for the thunder if you're hearing that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for breaking that down for the audience uh, that uh, the, the Webb Space Telescope here can break up the light 
to see the signatures of um, different molecules in the atmosphere, but it also can detect the planet when it passes in front of a star. Um, and that signature web is seeing this in some amazing detail. So that's really phenomenal. Um, so thank you for that explanation. All right, if we can go back to, um, I think we are now on slide four. And then you can uh, expand that again too. Great, so our next uh, first image from um, uh, uh, the Webb Space Telescope here is a planetary nebula, uh, specifically the Southern Ring Nebula. So um, let's throw this out to our panelists. Why don't you walk the audience through what we're seeing? What is a planetary nebula? Uh, there's two images here. Why do we see two images? What's so unique about that? And what kind of cool features might we be seeing here? So um, who would like to take this? Stephanie, go right ahead. This is one of my favorite images that we've released, so I am very excited to talk about it. <clears throat> so we're seeing um, two images from two different instruments. Um, so on the left hand side is the near infrared image of this uh, dying star. So this is a really old star that's already gone through its whole planetary phase, um, just as our solar system is going through now. And the star, um, once it starts to die, starts shedding all of the mass of that star. And when that happens, we see these sort of um, epic periods of, of giant ejections of mass, which is all dust and gas. And that's what you actually can see in these images. And so you see these sort of like arc structures surrounding the central star, um, which you can see in actually both of the images. And this is basically different phases or different epics of mass loss, which are quite extreme. The level of detail in these pictures compared to um, some of our predecessor images of this particular object or the Hubble Space Telescope images, for example, is just absolutely immaculate. You can see tiny little structures um, billowing through all the, the ejected material. The, there's dust that's sort of coiling around. You see bright arcs. You see very dark arcs. Um, and even more surprising and amazing in this image is that you also can see background galaxies that appear quite bright in this image. Galaxies are now a contaminant in almost everything we look at with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is absolutely mind blowing. But what I love even more about these two images is, it, is the right hand image, the mid infrared image. This is where we can actually see evidence of this and observe the second star in the system. Uh, we knew that this was a binary star system, but, but resolving that second star was something that was quite challenging to do, and you can see it in this mid-infrared image. It's that little red dot next to the center blue star. This is absolutely astonishing, um, the level of detail that we can get with these images um, with the James Webb Space Telescope. And not to mention that all of these instruments actually have the capability to do the spectroscopy that Nicole was just talking about, looking for those key fingerprints of different kinds of molecules or atoms in all of these environments so that we can really understand the physics, the chemistry, and the dynamics going on. Um, so there's a whole, you know, new world of study ahead of us. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And can I, can I, I just saw Klaus's hand. Yeah, um, so, and uh, I just wanted to highlight as well, and I think this pair of images, because the two images, highlights uh, that uh, how many infrared colors there are. Right? So you might think that infrared, oh, it's a color, it's infrared, but it's not. It's actually many, many colors that we just can't see with our eyes. There are more infrared colors than there are visible colors, and you can see there's so many, in fact, that we need more than one camera to see them all. And that's why we have two images here, because one is taken with a camera that works in near infrared color. So that's one section of the near infrared colors. And the other one is taken with mirror that works in mid infrared. So there's another part of the mid infrared colors. And the different colors show us very different things. So I just wanted to highlight that there are so many infrared colors. And, and that's one of the things that makes web so powerful. 
Klaus, I'm going to follow up with a question from the audience that's related to what you just said. So um, you mentioned that um, you know, th there's so many colors. So there's a question in, in the Q&A. These images are colored by the different infrared filters. Is it possible to convert these to true color images? That's a great question. These are true color images because infrared colors are just as real as as the ones we can see with our eyes. It's just it's it's not a limitation of of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's not a limitation of the world. It's only a limitation of our human eyes. So so the colors you see here are very real, uh, just as real as a Hubble image. It's just that you would need infrared sensitive eyes to see them. Thank you, Klaus. Um, uh, I'm going to open this up to the rest of the panelists. Would you like to add anything to, you know, what was your first reaction when you um, you saw these images for the first time? Go ahead, David. I guess I can just add that what really stands out to me, I think, is looking at the right hand image. It really encapsulates the new information that we get when we're able to look out at the mid infrared wavelengths we've got access to with you know, web now in such depth and detail for the first time in the sense that you, know, you can see what the very center of this nebula looks like in the two. And on the left, there's just a single star. And on the right, there's two stars. And you see this one very red star just you now popping out suddenly super obviously you can see it because you can see down to all the layers of dust to see this super buried source and it's just really exciting to me that we can see things before now that were you know, pretty much just unseen before we have a new ability to find things how about you nicole this is another case yeah i, I mean i don't know what i can add beyond what what has been said i think I really like Stephanie's point about, you know, things, any image now we're taking gets photobombed by galaxies in the background too, because it's showing you, you know, the universe is just so dense and rich, right, with information waiting for us to discover and find it. And that's why we have, you know, needed these infrared eyes and as Klaus was saying, all of these infrared colors to see what is going on here. And the same is true for all the other images, right? Um, there's just so much to learn and and this is only the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was definitely was I was just marveling at the um, the detail in these images and trying to see w what's different, what's the same in the left and the right and the the binary star in the Miri image on the right hand side. Oh, was, that was just amazing that they had never seen that before. And here it is right there. Um, so there's a question here from the, the chat related to this planetary nebula. So are both stars in the Southern Ring Nebula system dying? So I don't know that question, so I'm going to throw it back to our panelists. Are the two stars in this ring nebula on the right-hand side dying? Yes, I, I, can, take, I can take that. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so, so the uh, the star that is actually has given rise to this nebula is a faint one. It's one you can't really see in the near cam image. It's the red one in the mirror image. Uh, it's it's a stellar remnant now. It's a, it's a white dwarf that is incredibly hot. Like once a star has cast off its outer layers, it's essentially exposed the the this in, this intensely hot stellar core, a hundred thousand degrees hot, and that is what also lights up the whole nebula. Uh, the other star, the, the one that appears bright uh, in, in both near Kim and Mir, the blue one, um, is, is not dead yet, or, or, or as far as we know, approaching death. Of course, all stars eventually die. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a red one, and, and you see in Mir that's dying, or, or dead already, let's say. Thank you very much, Klaus. I did see another question about this planetary uh, nebula. So we have a question, how does planetary uh, nebula imagery help us to understand our own solar system? That's a great question. Um, so who would like to take that question? I see Stephanie. Sure. Um, so planetary nebula is a total misnomer. <laughs> It is really not a, a planetary system. As I said, this is um, well after a star has evolved beyond having 
um, planets around that star. So it's it's gone to a giant phase, and then once that giant phase um, becomes unstable is when it starts losing all of this mass. But even in the phase just before this, that red giant phase, the star gets so massive, it actually will usually consume most of the planets in, in its own planetary system. Um, so when our star evolves to this phase, it's going to you know, get a radius that's about the, the distance to Mars. Um, so it's going to swallow all of our, our terrestrial planets um, well beyond um, it, it enters this phase. But one thing that's really interesting about planetary nebula and something that we actually had discoveries with with other um, telescopes, including the Spitzer Space Telescope, is that sometimes when we get to this phase where we're losing all this mass and that that center star becomes exposed and it's extremely hot, as Klaus was saying, sometimes we see what what we believe are what we what's been called cometary knots. So there is these like. Um, what look like comets or some objects with dusty tails that are being blown off um, from the center star. So if you would look into the arcs of some of these images, um, you might see something that looks sort of like that. And we believe that this is sort of the remnant dusty icy material, maybe even planetary bodies that's now being dissociated that was in the outer planetary part of planetary system of these uh, former stellar systems. So. Um, while it is called a planetary nebula, it's not necessarily associated with a planetary system, the way that Nicole has explained to us with exoplanets or as you might think of within our own solar system. I, I, thanks for, I always want to say, Steph, thanks for bringing up that story because it's just about the the remnants of, of the dead planetary systems you see in white dwarfs, because it's one of my favorite stories that you, you look at these white dwarfs and you see sort of the skeletons of the dead planetary system that was once there. Uh, we can see it was there and it's it's now all all gone and destroyed but but we can learn something about it thank you very much for uh, sharing that with us um okay so i think we'll move to the next image um uh, that was shared today so next slide please so now we're going to talk about um one of my favorites galaxies uh this interactive interacting galaxies, Stefan's Quintet. And I'm going to throw this over to David, who um, is an expert in this area, and he could start us off with, what are we seeing here? Sure, so what you're looking at here is actually multiple galaxies similar to our own Milky Way, except instead of you know, living largely in isolation with only a, you know, one or two very small nearby neighbors, what we're seeing here is galaxies that have lots of very big neighbors and they're all interacting with one another now very dynamically. So the gravity from these galaxies, they're all very near each other, except for one, which I'll come back to in a minute. They're very near each other and the gravity from these galaxies is actually ripping stars and gas out of the other galaxies nearby as they merge together. So this is one of the major means by which galaxies grow from the you know, first tiny little nubs in the early universe up to the you know, giant you know, spiral and elliptical galaxies that we're familiar with today. They grow by smashing together lots of other little galaxies. And that's really what's going on here. We're taking you know, a number of galaxies that are in this compact group that are in the middle of merging together by gravity. And if we could watch the system for the next now hundreds of millions or billions of years or so, we'd see them continue to merge together and form one giant galaxy from you now all of the individual components. So what you're looking at here, if you look at kind of that central region, the bit that has the, the two brightish yellow dots near close to one another, that's actually two galaxies that have just recently flown by one another at a thousand kilometers per second. As they go by, they're starting to shred off stars from one another and you know, pull off gas and things as well. You can see giant shells of stars coming off of it in that galaxy at the top as well. But these are things that have been pulled out of the galaxy by yet another galaxy that's interacting with this group, kind of off screen off to the top left or so. What's particularly fascinating about this image though, and what's really new and what Webb brings to bear on this is if you look at all of the red and gold areas of this image, that's showing you where the gas is. We're seeing that with the MIRI camera on Webb. And so while the stars are kind of showing up in sort of yellowish white, the gold and red is the gas. That gas is what ultimately goes on to form stars and is the you know, 
also contains the dust that stars produce when they die. So it is the thing that stars from and the thing to which they return when they are done living. And even while these galaxies are you know, merging together and you know, tearing stars off of one another, they're triggering collisions in all this gas that they're ripping out from each other in the red and gold and forming new stars as they go. So this is going to be a quite a cluster to continue to watch for you know, many millions of years to come as it uh, forms new things and continues to give new spectacular views. Thank you, David. Um, so what um, might be a prediction of what this could look like after they interact together? Um, are there models? Do we, you know, what, what might happen a million, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of years down the road? for this yes. particular um, group of galaxies. So this is something that's known as a major merger in the sense that we're throwing together into the blender a lot of really massive things that are all interacting with one another. And what that does to the stars is it tends to scramble up all of those orbits pretty effectively. So if you started with some kind of a, you know, a disk, a spiral galaxy like our own Milky Way, Interactions like this are going to destroy those disks. Now that that disk is just going to get scrambled around, and probably what you're going to see if you look at something like this in another billion years or so, you'll see more of a elliptical type galaxy instead, something that's you now scrambled up all those orbits and it looks more round and smooth. As over the course of many hundreds of millions of years, those stars sort of rearrange themselves onto new orbits. And you'll probably pick up bits of new star formation going on in you know, various outer regions of that galaxy. But no, largely it'll be converting it to something more like the elliptical galaxies that we see today. Great. Thanks for painting us a picture that, you know, it's a little ways down the way, but. Uh... Yeah, you've got yes. a good wait around a little while to see exactly what happens. And now, some of these galaxies actually aren't going to be hanging around for that party. So I should add that that galaxy on the left-hand side, though, that isn't actually even part of the collision at all. It looks like it is. It's right there with all of the other galaxies, but it's actually about five times closer to us than the rest of the galaxies in the set. So that one's just going to go on its merry way while all the rest of them you know, do this merger in the background. Great. So while we're on this picture, another question came in here uh, that I'll open it up to all the panelists. Um, why do all the web photos of all the bright stars have the spikes pointing in a north, south, east, west direction? Is it um, is that actually visible or just part of the process photo? So uh, who would like to address that question? So these are the spikes in the particular image. I think the person is referring to, uh, there's two bright star-like objects in the upper right-hand corner. There's a few fainter ones near, um, near this bar near the bottom there. So um, who would like to ask that, uh, answer that? Go ahead, Klaus. All right, so um, this is an effect you see in any telescope. We see it in any camera, uh, what happens is that you see that light that is coming in is not particles, it is waves. And so light that comes into a camera, uh, that wave interacts with the shape of the aperture of the camera. So normally if you have to have a photo camera, so you have a round aperture. Um, and so that creates a, a simpler shape. Web doesn't have a round mirror, it's a hexagonal mirror, has six sides. And so what happens is when the light wave comes in and it interacts with that funky shape, you know, that's six sides. That's what creates those spikes that you see coming out. So you can think of it as sort of a, it's a fingerprint that you can use to identify the telescope that took the image. So if you go look at a Hubble image, that has, has, um, that has uh, four of these spikes, we call them diffraction spikes. You get some as well from the fact that there are some other obstructions in the in the aperture and so on, but that, that, that gets too detailed. So so Hubble has four um, and a little bit extra. Web has six and eight, depending on how you count. So you can always see this is a web image by that shape of the star. Yeah, that's uh we're gonna have we have we just are starting this new era of astronomy and having these amazing web photos. And we have Hubble photos too. So this will be one of those telltale signs to be able to distinguish between a Hubble image and a web image based on uh, these spikes 
uh, that you see in the images. Thank you, Klaus, for the explanation. All right, so we're going to move on to our next slide here and talk about the last uh, image that was shared today. And so here we have um, the star forming region uh, in the Carina Nebula. And it is also, um, you might have re heard it referred to as the cosmic cliffs. So um, who would like to share with the audience what we're seeing here? This amazing, this is one of my favorites. Um, I mean, I really do like clusters, but this is this is really, really, really close. Yes, Nicole, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can start off. Um, I, I, yeah, as much as I love the exoplanet spectrum, this one is just so stunning, <laughs> you know? It's, there's just so much detail here. I mean, honestly, all the images, right? If you zoom in, there's so much detail hidden. And that's the exciting part is what you're seeing here is these dense regions of cloud, of, of gas and dust clouds that are coming together to form new stars. So with the infrared images, so this is with the near cam instrument, near infrared light, you are able to see through the dust clouds into the cores to, to see the stars that are bright and shining and, and forming new stars and also presumably new planetary systems. So there's this, as the stars form, all this clouds of de uh, gas and dust collapses and it starts swirling and there's additional material left over that forms a disk once the star is fully formed and then from that disk is how planets form so it's all tied together in this process and so this is an early stage of the process when stars are forming uh, but without the infrared light you would just see the dust clouds you in the visible light so you have to have the infrared to see through the clouds and also just like the other image you see a lot of those stars with the diffraction spikes so those are really bright um, foreground stars in front of the cloud, uh, essentially. Um, but there's just so much detail here. So I definitely encourage people to, you know, zoom in and see, understand this cliff and look at it and find detail to see, okay, all the pockets where stars are forming because it's incredible. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, if anyone else wants to add anything, because. Oh, yes, please do. Um, so, <laughs> Klaus, David, uh, Stephanie, um, Please share uh, what you're thinking about when you see this beautiful view in front of you. Uh, David, I just saw uh, your hand. Yeah, I can just echo what you were saying as well in the sense that you now galaxies are the main things that I study, but you now this image makes me wonder if I need to reconsider just because it is so absolutely stunning, both from an artistic sense and also from a astrophysical sense in the sense of what it can tell us about now the now formation of young stars in regions like this. And I think one of the things I like about it particularly is that there's regions in it that are already new to us. And you know, we have some ideas about what might be going on there, but we're already learning new things about star forming regions just by looking at this you now very first released image of the nebula. And I think it's going to be giving us you now tons of wonderful information for many years to come. Quinn, I wonder if do you have a zoom in of the uh, art flow? Um, let me check real fast. Because you kind of you have to. There's a story yes. there, but you kind of have to zoom in to see it. So Travis, if you can go to slide twenty one, and then you can expand it back out. And Klaus, um, if you can speak to, um, do you know these features? I'm not sure. I, I'm not as familiar, so I can't step in. But Nicole, David, Stephanie, if you uh, uh, know more about this too, please, um, I'll have Klaus start and then we'll, we'll continue. This is my area, so, and I lived with these for six weeks, so, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so you see, what you see on the right there, you see, these kind of yellow, if you look below, there's a star and then you below it, there are these kind of kind of yellow things that look like a ship, kind of like a ship shape. Um, so what happens is that, that there's a young star there that is, uh, that just formed, so the star just collapsed out of the cloud. And when, when that happens, there's a little bit of rotation. And that rotation spins up material into a, into a disk that orbits the star. And that is where planets are forming. But as the material is, is moving through the disk and it, some of it is, is, is 
it's, it's crashing into the star. Some of that material also gets pushed out above and below the disk in these massive jets. And that's what you see here. So that's a protocellar jet. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's a clear sign that there's a star here that is actually forming at the moment. And what you see is below the star that the jet hits the cloud itself and that creates what's called a bow shock. It, it, it basically, it, it, it plows through the cloud and it creates a ship-like shape. But what I find really cool here is, and so, so these have been known before. Right? So what I find really cool about this is if you look at the other direction, there's also a jet and that jet has punched through the surface of the cloud. And you see like a puff of smoke as a bullet has, uh, or, you know, material has, has punched through the cloud. And you can actually, you can trace from that star all the way up to the top of the image as an arrow there where it says shocks. That's a bullet. And we caught that, and we didn't know it was there. That bullet there. We're just lucky that 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 was still in the in the field, just on the top there. So I find it really cool. And what you can also see, of course, is that the the jet in the bottom, the one that's plowing into the cloud, that doesn't get very far because it you know it has to uh, move through this cloud. But when it goes out of the cloud, it's just going through empty space, and so you went much farther, much farther away. And that's why it's way up there. So, so there's, uh, there's action here. There's like things happening all the time. The thing is churning and brewing and making stars. Still on an astronomical time scale, but you can actually, uh, if we come back and, and take an image of this again in a, in a year or two, we can probably th see things moving. Um, Travis, why don't you go to the next slide and Klaus, maybe you can talk about what the difference we see here in the images. Oh, back one. There you go. Yep, yeah, right here. Yeah, so that, that, that's a great one here. So um, so the insets now have swapped to an image that includes longer wavelength light that is taken with, with the mid-infrared instruments, so, so mid-infrared light. Um, what, what is helpful here is that now you see uh, a number of stars that are red and a number of stars that are blue, very clearly, right? Red, blue stars. Um, this means it's it, the red stars have hot dust around them. And we know today that that hot dust is those planet forming disks that they have like, like pretty much all young stars. These, and these are stars that, that will end up being like the sun one day. So you see solar systems forming here. And what, the, what an infrared telescope like Webb does is it makes it super easy to find them. Like right? whenever you take an image with Muri of of a cluster like this, you just pick out the red ones. Those are the ones that are, that are forming planets. The blue ones, uh, they're regular stars. They're probably in the foreground and the background um, and probably not young. So it just makes it really easy to figure out what's what. Thanks, Klaus. Um, we just saw some really amazing um, images, talked about some amazing um, description of what's going on. And I could see uh, the questions in the Q&A. So we're going to pivot towards the general Q&A. And I'm going to um, start it off by um, asking you, Stephanie, um, because you work on things in the solar system. And one of the questions that's been upvoted a lot is, will JWST be used to search for and study objects in the Oort cloud? So if you could describe what the Oort cloud is and then um, that question. Absolutely. So um, for those that don't know, we have um, multiple regions in our solar system that contain um, planetary remnants or the crumbs left over from when our planets formed in our solar system. And these major regions are known as the asteroid belt, which is um, sort of between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and sometimes we get asteroids that come in even closer, um, near-Earth asteroids that come really close to Earth. Um, we also have a region called the, the Kuiper Belt region. So this is sort of out by Neptune and Pluto. Um, there is some smattering of, of small objects that, that breach the asteroid belt into the Kuiper Belt and vice versa. Um, but this is where a lot of comets um, actually live. So comets that are that come around the sun pretty often or regularly. So uh, by regularly, that can mean anything from every few years to every 70 something years, like Halley's Comet. 
Um, but then we also have an, a region, a theoretical region known as the Oort cloud. So this extends even beyond um, what we know as the Kuiper belt. Um, and it's sort of this sphere that encompasses the entire solar system. So you can think of a giant shell that's full of cometary like objects. And we believe that this actually exists because every once in a while we get a new comet that comes into the solar system that has been um, upset from its current location and pushed into in towards the sun. But the orbit of these objects are something on the order of like tens of thousands of years. So we know that they're coming from somebody somewhere quite far, um, but not necessarily coming from another planetary system. Though we do have those now as well. We do know that interstellar objects come into our solar system. But we believe that these um, distant or long period comets are actually coming from something called the Oort cloud. Now, to study the Oort cloud is something that's very challenging to do because it's it's um, very far away. So using ground-based telescopes is very challenging. Um, and even something as sensitive as the Hubble telescope or the James Webb telescope will have quite a bit of challenge trying to, to study um, what these objects actually look like, what the density of the Oort cloud actually is, or any of those types of things. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope specifically is not really a surveying, searching kind of a telescope. We're not going to be taking big images across the sky, hunting for new asteroids or hunting for exoplanets the way the TESS mission is currently doing um, or the Kepler mission did prior, or even what the um, what some of these near Earth asteroid surveys are doing. The James Webb Space Telescope has a, a very narrow um, angle that it can actually see in any given moment of the sky. And so what that means is we do really, really well at honing in on one object and studying it very, very well, or that grain of sand held at arm's length. We're not looking at, you know, entire um, portfolios of, of the entire sky. So that being said, to study something like the Oort cloud and understand it, um, what we do want, what we can do with the James Webb Space Telescope is study the objects that are coming from it. So these new comets or new dynamic objects that are somehow perturbed and coming into the inner solar system. And that is something that I'm extremely passionate about and what I actually do for a living as I study these comets that are coming in. Um, and it tells us a lot about what that remnant material is. So as we just saw this beautiful Carina Nebula image, a lot of that gas and dust that you see there is not going to make it into the star itself or a planet. Some of it is actually going to be something like our asteroid belt or these cometary regions around those planetary systems. And so having that comparison that we can study the whole process of when these stars and planets are actually forming, studying planets around other stars and maybe what their asteroid belts look like, and even studying our own solar system, the preserved or leftover crumbs from when our planets formed all the way into our own planetary bodies in the solar system. Help us pull that picture together and understand what that process actually looks like. And our solar system, whether or not it's unique or whether or not it's just like all the other ones that we can observe. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. All right, we got another question here. So um, we have uh, a question about the exoplanet. Planet WASP 96b was found to contain water in its atmosphere. How common is it? How common is it to find atmospheric water on other planets? And would this be a planet where astrobiological bio life could be developing? So I think this is for you, Nicole. Right. So water, first off, is made of hydrogen and oxygen, and those are two of the most common elements in our universe. So actually, just by the process of how planets form in the first place, we've been talking a lot about that because of the star forming region, right? And how you evolve from a disk of material around a star that's formed into a planet. Well, that disk contains all these basic elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So as a planet is forming, it's actually quite common or expected to be common that it has water accreted into its atmosphere during the formation process. Um, so yeah, so and that's planets of, of all sizes. So this is a gas giant Jupiter sized planet. And it's not one that we're expecting to see any signs of astrobiological, you know, 
indicators of any kind um, because it's it's not just giant, <laughs> it also orbits very close to its star. So it orbits within about three and a half days. So our year on Earth is, is one year, right? It's 365 days. That's how long it takes Earth to go around the sun. And WASP-96b takes three and a half days to go around its sun. So it's very close to its star. It's very warm. It's giant. So it's not expected to be a place that is hospitable for any kind of life, <laughs> essentially. Great. Yeah, that's um, understanding the atmospheres of these exoplanets is going to be really amazing to get these signatures that we haven't been able to get before. So that's really exciting to know what's in those atmospheres. And, and Webb is going to be able to do it like no other other telescope has. So it's, it's exciting. Um, so some more questions here. Uh, we have a question um, with the understanding that our universe is expanding. Is it part of JWST's mission to provide significant contributions to our knowledge regarding the age, size, and shape of the universe and the location of our solar system within it? This is from um, Harvey Hamill, the Battle Point Astronomical Association in Brain Bainbridge Island, Washington. So I'll, I'll put that up uh, for, um, it's all David, go ahead. So I can speak a little bit to that in the sense that now, there's a number of things that Webb's going to do for us that are going to help us learn more about you know, cosmology and you know, the you know, early formation of the universe. The most direct one is we, what we want to see is where the very first galaxies came from. We want to try and understand when the you know, very first stars and the first galaxies you now turned on and started radiating and ionized the universe. We'd like to see when that happened. How long ago was it? What were these galaxies like? And how do they turn into the galaxies that we're familiar with today? But perhaps more directly to the question of cosmology, there's actually a tension at the moment that we're hoping that Webb might be able to help with as well, in the sense that if you try and understand how the universe is expanding, you know, how small it used to be in the past, how big it is today, how rapidly it's growing bigger, there's actually a few different ways that you can go about trying to measure what the expansion speed is, the so-called Hubble constant. And we're getting really good at measuring that in a, in a number of different ways now. And what's getting really fascinating is that our measurements are starting to disagree with each other. And it's getting to the point where you can't just you know, wave it off and say, no, there's uncertainty. They're actually starting to point to maybe there's entirely new physics in there. And what we're hoping that Webb can do is you know, by virtue of studying you know, certain kinds of stars and helping us refine the ladder to how far away different stars and galaxies are, you know, both with its depth and its infrared capability, it can help us figure out exactly how big of a discrepancy that is and how much new physics might really be waiting for us in our understanding of you know, how the universe came to be the place it is. So I think that's something to you know, watch this space here to see if it can tell us more about you know, where we all came from in that sense. Sounds really exciting with lots of things in it and lots of things that we will study. So I, I, um, I'm, we have a few more minutes. So I want to get to some of the top questions and maybe we can do some quick answers so we can get um, some responses, uh, answers to some of the questions. So I think this is for you, uh, you, Stephanie. What are the closest objects that JWST will be getting data on? Can you give any clues? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Um, JWST can actually observe near Earth objects. So as long as they are within the JWST, what we call field of regard or that tiny little viewing um, perspective that we have with the telescope and we don't point it towards the Earth and we don't point it towards the sun, um, we can actually observe these small objects as they come close to Earth. And that's something we absolutely plan to do um, all the way starting um, actually very, very soon. Uh, we even did some commissioning tests on studying some asteroids. Because they move so fast in the solar system um, compared to the other planets in our solar system, um, we actually tested how well we could track objects moving across the sky with the James Webb Space Telescope. And asteroids were our primary candidates for doing that. Um, and so we've demonstrated that we can now track these objects that are moving fast, that are coming pretty close to Earth. And it's something that we have a high priority in doing um, as far as solar system science goes for the next 20 years. 
Great, thank you. Um, so, I'm, uh, Travis, this is a question. Do we have a hard stop at seven o'clock? And I need to wrap up. Okay, that's great. So what I'll do, um, because I know everyone else um, in the audience and the host sites are planning for this to be done at seven, but there's two really upvoted questions that um, I will throw out and make it a two part question because they're a little bit similar. Similar. So how do we pick locations in the sky to look at with JWST? That's in reference to the images today. And how long did it take to process them and make them public? So I think this is a question for Klaus, who has been deeply involved with this process. So how about a quick two, three minute uh, explanation of what's going on? What, what Give us a glimpse into your world over the last six months. Sure, yeah, that's great, great questions. Uh, so the process of, of picking the first images is something that's been underway for years because we knew we had to do this, uh, you know, already, you know, Back in 2016 is the first time we, we started thinking about it just because we know we we're going to do this. What are we going to do? You know, it has to be something spectacular. It has to be something that, that really shows off the science that that web can do. And not just one kind of science, but the breadth of science it has to show off all the instruments. Um, and so there was a, a few people who, who got together and thought about that. Um, and they ended up with a very long list of, uh, of targets um, that gave us some flexibility. At the, at the end to, to actually observe what we could observe, what was visible at the time when we had to observe these. How much time does it take to process one, one image? I would say probably an average about uh, two weeks end to end from, from actually taking the data on the telescope, getting it down, uh, processing the data to a very high level of, of quality, uh, uh, handing that, those off to graphics artists to put them together from monochromatic images that are taken through a filter, to these color images that you see, um, and everything that that goes uh, goes along with it, so about about two weeks. Yes, and that it's amazing amount of time. We, there's a was a flurry of activity in the month of June that many of us would be really really um, uh, will remember for our lifetimes. So we're near the end. So I wanted to throw um, one last question for our panelists. Um, and ask you what is the biggest surprise or the most unexpected um, thing about one of the first images that you're most familiar with? So why don't we start with, uh, I'll start on my uh, uh, screen here, over here. I'll start with Stephanie, Nicole, David, and then Klaus. Um, the most unexpected thing, um, I was blown away with um, the Miri images of the Stefan's um, quintet. I, I can't believe the detail that you can see at the long wavelengths with the resolution of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I don't study galaxies, and um, as has already been said, maybe um, I need to change my field and um, start moving towards some galactic science. I, it was absolutely fantastic, and it, it blew me away. That's by far my favorite image. So I think it's my turn. Yeah, I, um, I have to say probably... Oh gosh, yeah, probably the Carina Nebula, <laughs> the detail there. I mean, there's detail in all the images, like I said before, but it's just almost like the fine structure you see, you know, for this this object that it's literally looks like artwork. I mean, it's it's just almost impossible to put into words how beautiful it is, right? And so it's not. Um, I guess I'm not surprised that Webb is capable of this, you know, but it's still a pleasant surprise to see just how beautifully it works kind of like right out of the box. <laughs> okay, I guess for me, it was probably just the wealth of galaxies you get in the background of other images. And we knew that Webb was going to see a lot of galaxies in the distant universe. I and mean, that's one of the main things that it was built for was to see these galaxies but just the ease with which they pop out in any other things you're looking at, whether you're looking at a nearby nebula, a nearby galaxy, or actually explicitly trying to do a deep field, the fact that you know, they just pop out. You, there's a Redshift 4 galaxy. There's a Redshift 8 galaxy. They're just you know, dropping out in such incredible numbers that I can't help but look forward to the 
amazing things that we can do with them in the years to come. Yeah, I would say for me, I mean, um, in terms of, of just plain beauty, the Karina is, is, is my favorite, uh, it's my baby. Uh, <laughs> I, I've looked at that for so, for, for so long. Uh, uh, and, and it was it was I was happy to see that some of the design choices we made they they came to fruition, but I think from a science perspective it's really the deep field surprised me the most, not in the sense that we could do a deep field right because we knew how sensitive this observatory was. It was when you look and you zoom in and I really uh, recommend anyone to do that to zoom in on those distant galaxies ten billion years old, and you, you may see some smudge with uh, Hubble. But here you resolve these galaxies into structures. Did you see individual star clusters forming in them like little dots? There's one object we call the ladybug, and it's 10 billion years old. Uh, it was a surprise to me. I did not expect us to be able to see that kind of fine structure in the galaxies. Detecting something there, yes, but seeing them as individual living, almost uh, indiv little creatures was, uh, was a surprise to me. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your perspectives on Webb's first images today. I'm sure the audience really enjoyed hearing your perspectives, what you found amazing and what we all saw today uh, for the first time. So I encourage you, um, just like Klaus mentioned, to go take a look at these images online, download the highest resolution images, um, and, and really take a look and marvel in that wonder of the universe that's out there. And Webb is going to uncover so many mysteries that we have and answer these questions. So again, I'd like to have a virtual applause for uh, all of our speakers today. Thank you very much for sharing uh, the science of Webb with our audience. Thank you in the audience for joining us today and um, hearing more about Webb's first images and um, what web will do to unfold the universe. So good day, good afternoon, or good night to wherever you are. Thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you. So uh, just out of curiosity, how many people had not seen any images before this? All right, cool, all right. Fantastic. Uh, so as part of the um, uh, our program coming up next, we're going to have two of our local solar system ambassadors uh, come up and uh, talk to us specifically about James Webb. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, Alan Rich. He is a scientist and engineer uh, with education, training, and experience in chemistry and engineering. Um, he's been a solar system ambassador since 2001. And he enjoys uh, taking deep topics such as astrophysics and rocket science and presenting them to pretty much any age group um, and educational level uh, in a way that's easy and simple to understand. So um, that's why he makes sense to me, because <laughs> he makes it simple. <laughs> All right, here's Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm here to talk about a couple of my favorite things uh, about James Webb, how it flies, which is weird and cool, how it sees, and how we talk to it. And for the first part, let me see if this works. Yes. <laughs> I almost said a dirty word. Okay. Uh, two cool things. Hello. Ooh, works. Okay, I need an assistant for this next part. The way it, when you think about um, orbiting, sending rockets up into space and orbiting, hi there. Have you ever, have we ever met before? No, we haven't. No. <laughs> You're wearing a JPL Rocket School t-shirt. You must know what you're doing. Luca here is going to play Earth, and I'm going to play the sun. 
And I'm going to show you how things normally orbit and then how James Webb orbits according to this Lagrange gravity surfing thing. Okay. Uh, if you know, this is a, I didn't have a spacecraft, but I've got this rocket here. This is a Boeing Delta rocket plush model. <laughs> if you're a rocket scientist, when you have your little afternoon nap, this is what you use. <laughs> Rocket. So anyway, normally when you think of orbiting, you send something up and he's the Earth here, it goes around and around and around like this, okay? And you're orbiting me, so he's the Earth, he's orbiting me, and I've got this rocket orbiting him. Okay, let's stop orbiting for a second and talk about this. Back in the 18th century, this guy named Lagrange worked out this math about two large objects like the sun and the earth, a third object put somewhere around us. There's five different places where if you put something that there's a gravitational effect that kind of equalizes things and leaves it there. Now, Lagrange point one, say I've got gravity. I've got more gravity than him because I'm bigger than him. I'm the sun, he's the earth. So this plush nap toy here is, uh, is gonna be more attracted to me with my bigger gravity than him. I'm gonna try my best not to hit you with this, but I'm gonna hit you with this. <laughs> okay, but at some point in between me and earth here, there's gonna be an equal pull it's not going to be closer to me, but it's going to be closer to him. And then that's Lagrange point one, that you can just park a spaceship there and now orbit me again. Okay? You just park a spaceship right there, and it does this. We've done that before with the Genesis mission. The Genesis mission was a spacecraft we sent up about 20 years ago, parked it at Lagrange point one, and let it collect the outer materials of the sun. And it came back to Earth. And this is where I hit him with it. <laughs> when it came back to Earth from Lagrange point one, it was, had these delicate sample of materials of the sun, and it was supposed to open parachutes and gently land in the Utah desert. But the parachutes didn't open, and boink, it crashed into the Earth like this, boink, just once but I like hitting him with it, so. <laughs> um, there's four more of these points. This is Lagrange point one here. It would be like fairly close to him if I'm the sun and he's the earth. Lagrange point two is where the Webb Space Telescope is going. It's behind him. Okay, now orbit me again. And this is how the Webb Space Telescope is going to fly. That's kind of hard. Lagrange point one kind of makes sense, and it's easy to see how that works. Lagrange point two doesn't really, and four and five are crazy. Just I'd have to put up some math up there for to even start that, and you don't want me to do that. Um, so Lagrange point one is the only one real easy to see. But the reason why we're putting Webb at Lagrange point two back here is, well, because we can. And two, it puts the Earth and the Sun, the, the Webb Space Telescope is, it looks at infrared. Any heat at all, any infrared from the Earth or from the Sun is gonna mess it up and lower its sensitivity to what it's looking at. So if we put, I'm the Sun, he's the Earth, if I put Back here, Lagrange point two, bonk, bonk. If I put it back there, his big heat shield can deploy web and shield web from both me and him at the same time. It's not in the shadow of the earth from the sun, but it's just so the earth and the sun are like this, and that huge tennis court size heat shield can open up and protect this thing from all the infrared radiation and heat. In fact, the tennis court size shield has an SPF of like a million. 
And you might say to yourself, did that guy just make that up, a million? No. And I'd say, duh, no, I did not make that up. It's a SPF of about a million. Okay, thank you, assistant. Give him a hand, give Luca a hand. Now this is this guy came up with this stuff in the 18th century, like rockets had not flown. Okay, uh, here's the Webb Space Telescope here at Lagrange Point Two, with the Earth and the Sun. Lagrange Point Two is a little bit unstable, so what? It, it's really a point in space, and when you're at a Lagrange point, you're sort of wobbling around it in sort of a circle. And it's not really stable, so the Webb Space Telescope has to make little rocket corrections periodically to keep it in the right place. And we had initially loaded enough fuel for 10 years of doing that. Thought, well, you know, 10 years, that sounds about right. So they put it 10 years of fuel to keep it at Lagrange Point 2. However, the launch with the rocket was so precise, and the placement of the uh, James Webb in Lagrange Point 2 was so accurate and so precise that we're going to have enough fuel on board to keep it there for about 20 years. Yeah. It's only going to work for a couple of weeks, though. So, you know. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. Okay, so it's about a million and a half kilometers, about a million miles away from the Earth, about four times further than the moon, so there is no way if something happens, a lot of these deep space missions, uh, New Horizons, Voyagers, things like that that go away from the Earth, there's no way that if anything goes wrong with it, it can be, we can have a rescue mission by astronauts to fix it. It's just too far away. Four times further than the moon. Yeah, that's kind of a key number of the Webb Space Telescope. It's four times further from the Earth than the moon is. Uh, we've done this before. I talked about Genesis. Uh, uh, there's, you know, we've done it before. Level three, four, and five, uh, asteroids and rocks and dust collect there and follow the Earth around in its path around the sun. And number four, I think, is in front of us. You could put a hidden planet at Lagrange Point 3, and we might not know it. Well, somebody figured it out. Whoops. Okay, that's how it flies. Okay, why is it infrared? The reason it's in infrared, it looks at infrared instead of the visible range is because one of the primary reasons that the Webb Space Telescope was made was to look back at the beginning of time over 13 billion years ago, over 13 billion light years ago. The, the galaxies at the very beginning of the universe is what it's looking for. Now, that stuff out there, it doesn't show up in blue and green and red and white. It's red shifted. It's so far away, the, the light from it that you see has been going for so long, over 13 billion years, and everything was receding away at speed when, it, when the light happened. But all of that light, the view we have of these super distant objects, has redshifted to infrared. So even if we had the nicest, biggest, ginormous telescope that you could stick your eyeball up on, we couldn't see it because it doesn't, they don't show, the stuff doesn't show color anymore. So you have to have an infrared telescope and that's what it is. And it's pretty cool. This heat shield, remember I told you that we have to shield it from the infrared and the heat of the earth and the sun. This heat shield is the size of a tennis court on one side of it, it's hot enough to boil water, and almost, not quite. And on the other side, it's cold enough to freeze nitrogen. So there's like a 500 degree difference between one side and the other with an SPF 1 million <laughs> rating. You're not gonna get a suntan if you're behind this. Okay, so we talked about how it flies, why it doesn't see in the visible range. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. Only a little piece of it right here is visible. On one side, ultraviolet. On the other side, infrared. 
And we've had, like I said, we've had uh, telescopes, space telescopes that have not looked in the visible range because, you know, deep in space, things that are blue and red and green, those lights are not necessarily intense enough to, to make it here. And they also have to go through dust clouds and through all kinds of stuff to get here. And color that we see with our eyes and with optical telescopes doesn't do that well. So if you really want to see things in deep, deep, deep space that's got to come through dust clouds to get here and it's got to be really intense to get here, you might want to put a telescope up that looks somewhere else in the electromagnetic spectrum. And Webb's doing it in the infrared because we're looking at stuff way, way out there where the only thing coming from it's infrared in the first place. And this is just some missions and where they've looked uh, in the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Let's get through this pretty quick. Uh, this was Hubble. It's visible in UV. And Kepler. Um, in the presentation that you just saw from Goddard, they mentioned um, Kepler, the planet hunter, and how it worked. Really cool how it worked. It stared in space at one place for a long time where there's a bunch of stars, and it's watching the stars for like over a year. And if, you're, if the star has a, say this is the star, if it has a planet orbiting it like this, that the planet comes in between us and the star, when the planet does that, it's going to make the star blink a little bit, just a little bit dimmer as, it, as the planet passes. And then if you see that, star blink once a year, then you've got a planet that's orbiting once a year. That's how Kepler worked, and it's one reason why you want to put space telescopes out, because to get images like that, just a long exposure, or you're watching for something to happen in the same little star, in the same little piece of the sky, you got to stare at it for a long time. And if your space telescope is busy orbiting the Earth, then every 90 minutes, it's like made an orbit. So 45 of that minutes of that 90 minutes, it's not, you got, there's a planet here. <laughs> That's not what you're looking at. So if you put something in space like Kepler or at a Lagrange point, you can stare at something nonstop without having the Earth rotate in front of you. Great observatories, these are some of our space telescopes, and this is a number that blows my mind here. How many space telescopes mankind has put into space? About 115. That just, I, I read that, and I'm like, whoa, I can't name two of them. Uh, but about, <laughs> I can name two, uh, maybe three. But about 56 of them have come from NASA in the United States. And a lot of them were launched aboard the space shuttle in the, the payload bay of the space shuttle. Okay, number three, cool thing number three. Ooh, I got a minute to tell you about this. How it, I told you how it flies, how it sees, and now how we talk to it. Um, NASA has this cool thing called DSN, the Deep Space Network. We have a series of radio dishes at three different places on Earth. One's in California, not too far from Los Angeles. The other one's in Madrid, Spain and the other one is in Canberra. They're located 120 degrees apart around the Earth, so that no matter where your spaceship is or where the Earth is spinning with your radio dishes, you've, we've always got a radio dish to point to wherever your spacecraft is that you need to communicate with. And um, I'm not a computer science person, but I've got some numbers down here. <laughs> um, and it may mean something to you. It doesn't mean anything to me. But the data downlink, the James Webb Space Telescope can downlink 28 megabits per second or 57 gigabytes of data per day. And that blows us away from most of the other spacecraft that we've, well, maybe all of them, that we've put up before, those numbers. And frankly, like I told you, I don't know whether to go, oh, that's, or ooh. I, but you can go, uh, uh, or ooh, if you want, depending on what that number means to you.
And James Webb is a time machine, like we were talking about. It's looking back. And you know, if you just look up in the sky at night, your eyes are a time machine. There is the closest stars are, it's the light, the view that you're seeing has been coming from them for about four years. So the closest stars, if they blew up two years ago, you're still gonna see that star for two more years before you see the explosion. And every star that you see, the, the moon is like a light second away. When you look at the moon, that's not really what it looks like right then. It's what it looked like about a second ago. And the sun is, I think, seven minute, light minutes away. So in the middle of the afternoon, our sun could have, if it blew up three minutes ago, you know, you're not gonna know it for another four minutes. It's still gonna look like the sun, go, oh, it's, it's cool. No, it blew up <laughs> four minutes ago. You'll find out here in four minutes, <laughs> you're gonna burn. But everything you see in the sky when you look up, it's a time machine. Every star, the light from every star has come at you at a different number of years. That's, look up in the sky at night, that's not what the, everything looks like right now. It's what everything looks like, as many things as, as many different things as you see, that's as many different times in history that you're seeing all at once. And I just put a few pictures of James Webb in here with some people that were working on it so you can get, uh, uh, you know, comparison of size. And this is the entrance. Uh, JPL, JPL, the reason I put JPL here, this is the Black Knight. Um, he's already lost one of his legs. He's the security guard at JPL. He has orders to chop my arms and legs off if I ever show up. Um, but JPL runs NASA's Deep Space Network. Um, so all of the data from James Webb comes to JPL, which is it, uh, in Pasadena. That one? That one? I'm about out of time. It, whoops. Well, I am. <laughs> I just turned it off. <laughs> so. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Awesome. All right. Uh, so next, uh, I'd like to introduce Tony Rice. Uh, he is a actually fresh from WRAL. Uh, <laughs> he is a data scientist with Cisco um, in RTP, uh, and he is also a volunteer with the NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador Program. Uh, you've been doing that for over a decade now. I have. And uh, on top of that, uh, you may have seen him frequently on WRAL. Um, and sharing lots of information about NASA missions and programs, uh, as well as on uh, nationally on the Fox Weather Channel. He also works with nearly 400 broadcast meteorologists across the U.S. and Canada, uh, helping them share the night sky with their audience. So, Tony, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Well, did I turn it off? Do I need to use this one? Should be able to use that. There we go. So, well, there we go. We got my uh, slides up now. So thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. This is a, a wonderful room. I have some great memories in here of some previous missions that we've celebrated here, some of them very late at night, so it's nice we were able to do this at a, a nice, reasonable time. Uh, I was just talking with my friends back at WRAL about the very images that we were looking at here. It's, it's very exciting. We've been waiting for this for... Well, six months since launch, as uh, Alan probably mentioned, uh, this launched bright and early on Christmas morning. Uh, I was the first one up at my house. Uh, when you got a 21-year-old in, in the house, he doesn't get up at the crack of dawn anymore. But yeah, I, I got to watch the, the launch and go back to bed before we, we did Christmas. But this is a, a very exciting day. So what I wanted to share with you a little bit was you know, build on some of the things that, that uh, Alan has talked about. Um, as I look at these images, they're very, very exciting, and it's awesome to see the extra detail, and we'll look at that a little bit more as well. But I look at this, this machine here, and I think back to the first time I saw it in the Goddard Space Flight Center in the, uh, the giant building there, the giant clean room that you see it in here right now. Actually, this is probably at Lockheed where it was being built, but it spent some time in the clean room at Goddard, and I, I saw it at a point where it looked like an Erector set, I mean, just barely being put together. They were building the Star Tracker. The, um, 
the equipment that helps it uh, you know, point and find what it's looking at. It's just really, really early to see it got to this point. So each one of those hexagonal mirrors is covered with gold, and that seems kind of, uh, kind of wasteful maybe or, or, or kind of gaudy, but it's very, very purposeful why that material was chosen. Gold does an excellent job at reflecting infrared light. And as Alan was mentioning, as you heard throughout the, the broadcast, uh, we previously heard from the NASA scientists and the scientists up at the Space Science Telescope Institute, uh, this is all about infrared. We'll, we'll dig into that a little bit too. So let's go ahead and take a look. But first, I gotta brag on James Webb a little bit. Yeah, maybe you heard this, maybe you haven't. This is a good North Carolinian. So James Webb is from Oxford. He grew up in, uh, in and around Oxford. Uh, there's a, a highway marker that was recently placed there honoring his time at NASA. I was sitting in a, a meeting at the uh, North Carolina uh, Department of Natural Resources years and years ago, and I happened to be sitting next to the person who was responsible for those highway markers. And I commented, and I said, it's really cool that there's a highway marker outside of the Moorhead Planetarium uh, that you know, celebrates some of the contributions that was made to NASA there. I said, why don't we have one for James Webb? And she said, James who? I said, oh, you gotta learn. We got a good North Carolinian here. He was NASA administrator during, from 61 to 68. So he wasn't quite there when the Apollo missions launched, but he was very much responsible for us. Went to uh, UNC, he got his degree from UNC. There's his picture in the yearbook. I knew that garner a few bits of applause down there. So there's that, uh, there's the sign uh, that was uh, uh, set. It's around the corner from his home, uh, actually in front of an elementary school there, which I think is great because the kids get to see this every day when they come in. Uh, the, the folks you see down there is the mayor of Oxford. Um, the two folks on the left-hand side are his kids, are James Webb's kids. They were up in, um, uh, up in DC. Uh, on Monday night for the reveal there, so they got to see a little bit more of that, and a town historian, so I gotta brag on him a little bit. So let's talk about some of the engineering. When I look at those images and I see the incredible detail and all those new stars that we've never seen before, that's amazing, but just as amazing as the engineering. That engine right there, Alan mentioned that we're gonna get 20 years, probably a little bit more, out of this telescope even though it had to do five, we planned for 10, we're gonna get 20 years in large part because of that engine right there. It was selected by one person at the European Space Agency that went through their whole collection of engines that could sit on this Ariane 5 rocket. He picked the one that had the best specifications because he wanted to be able to put this in the best orbit possible. So as I, I show you some other of the engineering uh, animations here that shows how this unfolded. Notice the top of this rocket. That giant telescope you know, with the sunshade the size of a tennis court is folded up in the, si in the top of that rocket. Anybody here of a, a fan of the Transformers? Uh, Peter Cullen, who vo voices Optimus Prime, they released a video where he calls this his new friend. He calls this telescope his new friend. But you know, this is how this worked. We've got this telescope on the Ariane 5 rocket, very specifically chosen that rocket was, and now the fun part go, happens. Because if anything from here on goes wrong, the images we saw today would have never happened. So the first thing that's gotta happen, and this is actually one of the few items that is happening automatically, is we gotta deploy that antenna. There's a very small antenna on board to do some of the initial telemetry and things like that, so you know it got placed into orbit properly. Uh, but that antenna that just got deployed there, that's the main antenna that the engineer's gonna be able to communicate with the spacecraft. So once that happened automatically, and notice in the, the upper part there, the, the time going by. This took quite a while to happen. We wanted to take our time with it. We wanna make sure that we got it right. So the next thing that's gotta happen is this sunshade. This sunshade allows us to see those really deep images. Uh, Alan mentioned how incredibly warm it is on one side and how incredibly cold it is on the other side. This is what makes that happen. The sunshade is the size of a tennis court. It is thinner than a human hair. It has ripstop technology built into it because it's going to get holes in it. It already has. Some of the mirrors have already been struck by micrometeorites. They are out there. In the 20 years it's gonna be out there, this thing is gonna be pockmarked. 
So we're going to lose a little bit of the thermal capabilities probably. And that's okay. You know, it's all planned for. But that ripstop will prevent, and I'm talking stuff that's the size of a grain of sand, but it's going a couple 10,000 miles an hour, which causes a problem. So that has to be deployed out. Now, notice down at the bottom, there's, there's five layers there. It's all stacked together. If anybody's ever insulated their house, you know the secret to insulation? Or if you own a cooler, or if you own you know, one of those nice uh, uh, water mugs that you know, has the, the insulation to it, it's all about gaps in there. So our next step, let's put some gaps in there. And the temperature difference from the hot side to the cold side, it gets getting colder and colder and colder because it's not allowing that heat energy to pass through. The near vacuum of space provides really good insulation. That's the whole purpose of this. So it's stretching it out so that it has those really good thermal properties, and it's also spacing them out so that, uh, you know, again, that, that, um, that heat will not pass through. I should probably pause here and talk about some of the motion that's happening. Um, it looks like there's motors that are doing this, and there's a few motors involved with this, but for the most part, we're talking about, you know, that, that first couple of weeks of physics class. We're talking about stored energy. We're talking about basic machines. When it comes to space flight, you always want to have the simplest thing up there. The simplest thing is the best, and the thing that has worked over and over again on previous missions. You want that in place because it's gonna reduce your risk. It's all about buying down risk here. So all the motion that you see here for the most part is cables that have been wound, is springs that have stored energy. And they're being commanded from the Earth after lots of tests and lots of checks to make sure that the previous step went exactly as we expected. But it's all about releasing that stored energy of, of the springs and, and, and wound cables and things like that. So, you know, think back to that image of the rocket rising up. That poor telescope is all crunched up in there. Not only is it in a tight place, but it has got all that bound energy in there just waiting to be released. So the way it's released, uh, we don't have somebody up there, obviously, to press a button or flip a latch or whatever. For the most part, we're using uh, what are called frangible fasteners. They're basically bolts that have gunpowder in the middle of them. You have a uh, electrode on one side, an electrode on the other side. You pass electricity across it, really easy to do on command uh, using the onboard computers, and it breaks. And we can design those bolts in a way that they'll break down the, the long ways or across the middle, and break however we want so that the energy gets released in the right direction. And those have been used forever, and we use them on, on fighter jets, Everybody saw Top Gun. Everybody seen Top Gun? You saw all those uh, missiles being released? Same kind of idea. Those are bolts that are explode and uh, release the missile. And we've been using them in the space program forever. So that's how a lot of this is happening. Let's move on to the next step. So, you know, right now we got all our mirrors folded up. It's time to unfold the mirrors. And yes, this is a giant telescope. Yes, it's up in space, but it works the same way that any of the, the telescopes that uh, you might see the Raleigh Astronomy Club use or um, you know, any type of a, a home telescope, uh, at least a reflecting telescope. There's always two mirrors. There's a secondary mirror, and then there's the primary mirror. So the secondary mirror is sitting out in front of the primary mirror. It's gathering all the light that the primary mirror in those 18 mirror segments are putting together and shining it back through to the business end on the backside. That's where the computers are. That's where all the sensors are. So now it's time to deploy the primary mirror. So at this point, we kind of have a telescope, uh, but we don't have all of our mirrors deployed. So right there, that's a... Um, a radiator that's gonna help push some of that heat away from the computers and things like that to keep those instruments really, really cold. So it's time to pull those wings around and finally make the, the full form of those mirrors. Again, springs, stored energy, super, super simple. But lots of things could have gone wrong here. It took a long time to put this telescope together and it's because of the complexity here and it's because Again, nothing could go wrong, and nothing did go wrong. So uh, I took these numbers this morning straight off the telescope. Uh, these are the current temperatures as of about 10 o'clock this morning uh, on board there. We've got sensors all over it, um, 390 below zero on that, that primary mirror. But actually, if you look down there at the source instruments, the science instruments, it's um, 
450, that's six Kelvin. At zero Kelvin, motion stops in atoms. You know, there's quantum motion still, but you know, the, the basic kind of motion that's coming from a, a, an electron orbiting uh, the center of the atom, atom, that's gone. That's how cold we've got to keep these things. This is the state that it's got to be in to see in the infrared spectrum. And on the opposite side, um, I don't know that I want to cook my burgers with that. I want that a little bit warmer. But does it surprise you to see that it's 123 degrees in space? It's not cold in space. It's actually pretty hot in space, depending on where you are and what side of the sun you're facing. Uh, one of the, the, the test apparatus up at the Goddard Space Flight Center that some of these instruments went through and a lot of other spacecraft went through uh, simulates the, the near vacuum of space. And you know that's part of the test. We want to make sure that it can survive that. But this particular test chamber, its purpose is to simulate this, is to be able to take something uh, uh, from 150, 200 degrees down to several hundred degrees below zero, like that. And what we're simulating there is spacecraft and Earth orbit, because they're going from light to dark, light to dark, you know, every 90 minutes. So um, that's really hard on electronics. It causes things to expand and contract. So we tested some of that there. But like you, like you see, it has reached the temperatures we needed to reach, and that's how it um, w was able to produce those images. And this gives you kind of an idea of some of the testing that went on as well. Uh, what you see over there is the actuators that are moving those individual mirror segments around, and I'll show you a little bit of that. So this is the backside of one of those mirrors, and it is one of the neater bits of engineering here. Um, so it's got a couple layers to it. It can move in X, Y, Z planes. They call this the, the piston motion. It can also rotate, as you just saw there, and it can reform. The, the face of the mirror itself can reshape. Uh, purpose there is we never want to have a Hubble happen again. We never want to have a spacecraft out in a place that we can't reach it we definitely can't reach it a million miles away. We were fortunate with Hubble because we could take the shuttle up there and make repairs. Can't do that here. So we need to have the flexibility to aim these mirrors and correct any problems. And this certainly gives us the ability to do that. So the company that built this is Ball Aerospace. And I bet you have a Ball product sitting in your kitchen right now. They make canning jars as well. It's a different division. They have a space division. They have a home canning products division. I kid you not. So this is how that works. This is what the very first image that came out of the telescope looked like. That's supposed to be one image, and that's OK. Uh, this is a selfie that we didn't think we'd be able to, to take. Um, there's no other cameras on board here. All the cameras are there to, uh, to do science. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see cameras on the side of rockets during launches. That's great fun to see. One of the questions we get a lot is, you know, why, why don't we, are we able to see James Webb sitting out there a million miles away at that Lagrange point? Well, it, it isn't designed to do that. And quite frankly, I don't think we could put together a, a visible spectrum camera uh, that could survive those incredibly cold temperatures. Plastic doesn't do well in... Uh, those kind of cold temperatures. The infrared cameras are very specially designed to be able to survive this, but we were able to pull it off and, and repurpose a couple of the sensors to pull off that selfie. But that's what it looked like. That should be one point of light. And here are those points of light mapped to which of the mirror segments that uh, was creating it. So the next step was to get those to a single point. Actually, we're going to get them organized so that it kind of matches this honeycomb figure. Um, one, one kind of interesting thing about that, the, the gold there, if you were to scrape all of that gold off of the primary mirror and the secondary mirror and uh, form it into a ball, it'd be about the size of a golf ball. So not a lot of gold there, but it does serve a very important purpose. So we were able, like I say, we were able to identify which light was coming from which. That's really important because you need to individually move those mirrors to get it to We're sorting things out. We're getting it organized. Now, once we know what's what, we can then get to the point of bringing them together. So they're still pretty blurry, but we got it. So 
that's the before and here's the after. One particular star we pick to be able to do this kind of adjustment. So now I got a little eye candy. Uh, would it be possible to bring the, the stage lights down a little bit? Because I want to make sure we can see these really good. We got a great projector here in this hall. So thank you very much. So on the left hand side, this is the Spitzer Space Telescope, an example of what it was able to do. Over on the right hand side, that's Webb with its medium infrared camera um, down to about seven uh, microns uh, of, of wavelength of light. That's the same target. You can see how much tighter it is and how much better the image is. So we got a little taste last week. This is from the guidance sensor. Uh, if you've ever, anybody here has a, a telescope or uh, has ever had a telescope, you know that little tiny, uh, useless, tiny telescope that's on, on top? I tear them off mine immediately. I, I, don't, I don't use them. Uh, that's the equivalent of this. This, used just to point the telescope, immediately became the deepest image we have ever seen in our universe. Well, that record lasted for about four days before um, uh, President Biden released the, the deep image last night. So, you know, let's see a little more eye candy. But this time, let's compare it to Hubble. So when I look at Hubble, don't get me wrong, Hubble's a great instrument. It has rewritten the history, or the science books. Webb's going to do the same. But when I look at, at Hubble, it's focused in that, that visible spectrum. It gets a little bit into the infrared, just a tiny bit, and, and also into ultraviolet. It's just not designed to look into the deep parts of our universe the way Webb is. So when I look at, at uh, Hubble's images, they look like watercolors to me now. They seem so, so sharp and so beautiful back then, but now we're starting to see a lot more structure. So that uh, bright light you see in the middle there, that's a uh, black hole. Pretty cool. So here's the image that was released yesterday. That is a Hubble image over there. And you notice how the colors are kind of wonky there? We're really fortunate that we got these color images to begin with. These telescopes are not full color. These telescopes are aimed at specific wavelengths of light because you know, we're doing science with them. So uh, back a decade or so ago, the Hubble team up at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, we've had guests down from uh, from that organization for astronomy days here at the museum. So, you know, a great, great relationship there. They had to specifically make up time on the Hubble telescope, because as you might imagine, there's lots of scientists that want to use it. So time is very, very limited. They make up time to specifically get these color images. And the way you get the color images is you look for the red wavelengths, and then you look for the blue wavelengths, and then you look for the green wavelengths, and you stack them up. That's what you kind of see over there. A um, little bit different, different technique over here, but um, something to point out here, so I've kind of got it oriented so that they're the same. You see these streaky things here? Uh, my family came to me Monday night after uh, these were released and said, oh no, we got another mirror problem. Uh, are you going to be talking about mirror malfunctions for the next couple of years? I said, no. No, the mirrors are fine. We, we got those sorted out just fine. Those streaky areas you see right there, and you might have seen a little bit in the previous video, that's gravitational lensing. So you're seeing light bent. Um, the best way to describe gravitational lensing is picture a big trampoline. Now, picture you're rolling a tennis ball across that trampoline. You roll it fast enough, it's going to get to the other side, and it's going to go in a straight line. Light also travels in a straight line until it doesn't. And the way it doesn't is, picture that same trampoline, drop a car in the middle, drop a hundred bowling balls in the middle, it's going to bend downward, maybe even touch the ground. If you roll that tennis ball across, you roll it slow enough and it's going to roll into that mass you just stuck in the middle. But if you roll that tennis ball fast enough, like, I don't know, the speed of light, it will curve around, it'll ride the outside of that curve. and ride around the mass and continue going on its merry way. So that's what's happening here is light's being bent around uh, this mass of galaxies in the middle. And what that means practically to the scientists that are looking at this is we can now see things that were hidden behind. Uh, this is something that, that Einstein theorized before we even had the ability to see something like this. And he was absolutely right. That happens a lot with uh, things that Einstein has said. So I'll leave you with this one. Um, this is one of my favorites. I mean, this really shows you how 
um, Hubble kind of looks like a watercolor. Kind of doesn't look real, looks like an artist painted it. When we see the kind of detail that the Webb telescope is capable of, you know, down here on, on the bottom side, that is absolutely the same patch of sky. And uh, we can see what kind of, of capabilities that the Webb telescope is, is, is capable of providing. Um, one little factoid, you might have heard it on the, uh, the, the, the NASA director uh, mentioned it yesterday. This image right here, this one, um, it's not in our sky because this is in a, a, a southern constellation, so we actually can't see it. Can't see it anyway because it's so far away. But to give you an idea of how big of a patch of sky you're seeing here, um, the director mentioned a grain of sand. Take a grain of sand on your fingertip and hold it up there. That's how much of the sky you're covering to make this image right here. If you got a sewing needle, that's another way to do it. That hole of the, uh, the eye of the sewing needle held at your arm's length, uh, you'd have lots of room around it to fit this picture in there. So just amazing, amazing things that these telescopes can provide us. With that, I think we have questions next. Okay, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Alan. Uh, fantastic. So I'd also like to bring up uh, some of our other solar system in, uh, ambassadors. So come on up, Jeff. Come on up, Adam. And what we'd like to do is now uh, we'll be passing around some microphones. So if you just kind of raise your hand, um, and uh, they'll come out to you, and we can get uh, folks answering the questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. I think, Ann, we have a question right there. Come on up, guys. You get to get to be in camera. So I have a question on photographs. You can make sure you use see if this works. Yeah. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. I have a question on the photographs. Um, how did since James Webb is infrared, how did you get how did they get the color in there again? I think you may have. Yeah may have explained it to so me. So I, I can briefly talk to that, uh, but basically what you're doing is that there are, uh, each of the, the cameras is uh, specifically tuned to certain wavelengths of light. And so when all those images are brought down, uh, all of those images are stacked and each of those wavelengths is assigned a color. So that's color. not the real color of those images. Oh. There are colors, our eyes can't perceive it, but. So another thing to keep in mind here is, and, and Alan kind of alluded to it a little bit in his presentation, everything is infrared, because that's all that will make it here. But everything didn't used to be infrared. It used to be some visible wavelength of light. It used to be you know, higher up in the electromagnetic spectrum. But by the time it makes it to us, it is in the infrared, because again, that's all that'll make it to us. But also because of the expansion of the universe. As the universe continues to expand outward, outward it carries that light with it and stretches it out. The longer wavelengths of light tend towards red. So when we say we're looking at infrared images, don't think that it's just locked and the only thing we ever see is infrared. It's things that are infrared by the time they make it to us. Scientists have ways of knowing uh, what colors things really are, even though you've just taken an infrared picture. It's uh, real complicated stuff, and I don't understand any of it. But it's sort of like if you go out through the museum, and they'll, there's this dinosaur fossil, and they, they said, this dinosaur walked three miles per hour and ate only radishes. Like, how did you know that? All you've got is bones. But astronomers are the same way. They know what the real color is, so that by the time you get to see the pictures that you download from the website, it's been corrected uh, to what it really looked like, even though that's not the exact image. It's just ones and zeros that comes off the uh, web anyway. So you correct that to what you know is the correct color. That'll make it four for four then. Uh, so that brings up one point too. When you see images on social media or from the news as well, um, make sure you go back to nasa.gov, go to the James Webb uh, website, because you'll also see uh, footnotes on each, Im each image. So you can see if this is processed in artificial color or if it's processed from the infrared color, you'll actually get notes on what's been done to that image. Um, you'll see a lot of false color images, a lot of times because they're the most interesting ones to look at because they'll have so much false color. But you can pull up those original, that original image or raw data image uh, before it's been processed, all from NASA.gov.
Hello. So, uh, burn, go off into the atmosphere. What? How does that? Uh, so that's a good question. Decommissioning. Uh, I don't know much about it, but I know you can't because it's nowhere near uh, our atmosphere. But yeah, it's uh, the Lagrange point is unstable, and it's actually technically right now orbiting the sun. And as that orbit becomes unstable, it's going to leave of Grange Point 2, and it will enter some, I mean, it's hard to tell, exact, hard to plan it out exactly, but it's going to go into some useless orbit around the sun or crash into something, hope not us. But uh, it's, it's not going to stay indefinitely at Lagrange Point 2 without uh, rocket fuel to make corrections. Yeah, and a further, I think if you imagine, and I, Tony, you might have actually told me this once, um, sitting at Lagrange Point 2, it's actually, you think of it as almost like sitting up on top of a hill. And you've got to use some amount of energy, not a lot, but some of, amount of energy to stay on top of that peak of the hill. And when you run out of fuel, you can no longer do that, and you kind of roll off. I actually listen to you. So do I. Hi. Um, so the picture of the Carina Nebula, I'm not a rocket scientist by any means. I understand that our planet and our sun, we have a whole lot of iron in our solar system. Um, so those images of the gases and whatnot, can you tell using like spectrometry and like the infrared what those gases and materials are? Are they similar to what's in our uh, galaxy or... Yeah, I, I, exactly. So you, that's exactly it. You can use spectroscopy and basically uh, understand the absorption rate and the absorption lines to see what particular elements are on there. So oftentimes they will assign uh, certain colors to certain elements. Well, what, what are those elements? Um, the, foot line, the, the foot lines for that exact image from today have all the uh, detected so have all the detected spectroscopy done so far on the Carina Nebula, so you actually can see on its footnotes. I just can't remember from this morning uh, what they are, but if you go back to the NASA.gov image, you'll see all the notes of what they've uh, discovered so far. And you pronounce spectroscopy really, really well. None of the news anchors I talked to today could do that. <laughs> In the first part of the presentation, it showed uh, the Eta Carine Nebula, in that particular image, I wonder if one of those stars was actually the star Eta, which is supposed to be the most explosive and most uh, unstable star in the universe. They say it's five million times brighter than our sun. Yeah, I don't think uh, Eta Carina was anywhere in, in what they showed. Uh, in fact, most of those stars, if you ever go back and look at the um, both versions of them, the Hubble and the uh, James Webb, you can actually see the stars that were blocked by the gas. And that just shows the amazing power of, of using that infrared um, view to actually now see stars inside the nebula. Just saying that the ring, the ring nebula we looked at earlier as well, it's actually a, a, a double star system. And with, with, with the near and forever, you're able to see that it's two stars. And it's a half light year across. It's, it's really hard to wrap your head around the sizes of some of these things. Yeah, when you look at the southern ring, it is um, on its long side, it's 0.7 light years wide. On its narrow side, it's 0.2. So when you think about that, it takes from that center, it takes, you know, Point one of a light year to go to either side, or you know, point three and a half um, um, years for light to cross that distance. So it's. Uh, okay, excuse me. What is the exposure time of the five pictures we saw? How do you define that exposure time? So I try to see these pictures. You know, how do you? The exposure time is very important. So in a yeah. little bit more details, please. Thank you. I don't have those details, but I think if you go back to the uh, NASA.gov mission site, you'll have that information. I believe we'll have that information. Um, so oftentimes, you'll have not only the individual exposure times, but you'll have how many exposures were then stacked together and, and the processing. So I, I think the question is, are the images mosaics? Is that your question? Yeah. 
yeah, so the, the, yeah, the question is, you know, what, what are the exposures and stacking? And yeah, I, I think every target's gonna require a, a different set of exposures. And if it's anything like uh, amateur astronomy, <laughs> which is what I can speak to, you're gonna have to make sure that, you know, there, there's gonna be an optimal uh, exposure um, and a stack that will get you the best results. So every object's gonna be d different based upon its luminosity, the surface brightness, uh, and at times kind of where it's located, what are the, some of the background objects? Nope. Okay. So the neat thing with the James Webb is the mirror being so much bigger. Uh, it's about 21 feet in diameter. Uh, it actually has the same similar resolution as Hubble did. Um, but it's that exposure time that we're able to greatly reduce with James Webb that's so impressive. So I don't have the exact figures for all the five or the four images today, but I all know that within an hour, a couple hours, that's it. Uh, images like that would have taken several days with the Hubble to get. Uh, and the Hubble also would have had to use multiple filters. There is a really big, uh, incredible filter wheel, filter, filter wheel on the James Webb telescope as well, which allows us to overlay those images. But all those images we saw today were very, very in, in terms of astronomy, were extremely short exposure times. Yeah, the line I heard from one of the uh, astronomers was, where it took us a week to generate an image with Hubble, uh, we can get some of those images before breakfast with Webb. Okay, so I'm not sure if I didn't mention this earlier, but we are also broadcasting this program. And so we do have some questions on YouTube. And so I'm going to let Hugo represent those folks watching. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And we want to thank you, all the people on YouTube. So we don't have only people from North Carolina, but we have from Texas and California. And we have two questions. So Rachel has noticed something on the logo of the web. Uh, they said, why does the web patch have a Hubble star with four spikes? On the first part of the presentation. Yeah, it should have six spikes. <laughs> That's a g very obs uh, uh, observational. Yes, yes. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Oops, OK. <laughs> yeah, NASA hires not only scientists, but artists as well. So that's probably an artist rendition is probably the answer. Okay, and Samantha wants to know, can we see before the Big Bang if we look far enough? I'm gonna try that one, and I'm sure you guys are gonna bail me out when I uh, fail miserably. Uh, we are going to get as close as we have ever gotten to the Big Bang with this instrument. Uh, we will not be able to get that far back. And the, the delta there between the Big Bang and where that first light we're gonna, we haven't seen the oldest light with this yet. 13.5 billion years is more than I was expecting. I was expecting five with that first image, based on what we've seen with, uh, uh, with Hubble. We got 13.5. We're going to do better than that. How far back we can go, we don't know yet how far that's going to be, but we do know that the physics tells us that we won't be able to go all the way back to the Big Bang. And that delta is going to be measured in billions of years. Millions? Billions? Yeah. Okay. See, I told you you'd bail me out. So universe is 13.8 billion years old, then you basically have a time when the universe was so thick and it basically, you, light could not go through, it was too dense. Um, and they call that the dark ages. Um, at some point then it becomes, you know, uh, trains are basically uh, not dense enough where light can transmit through, but then you've got to wait for the first stars to actually be born and to start emanating light. So you will, I'll say it here, you cannot go back to the Big Bang because you need light to go back to the Big Bang. There was no light then. Or whatever it was was completely obscured and you couldn't go through the, the density of the, uh, the universe at that point. So um, how many pictures are predicted to um, or how many photos are predicted to that are taken? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um. Let, me, let me try that. So I mentioned that we learned a lot with with the uh, with the Hubble telescope, and had to really remind the scientists that they had a wonderful toy to play with there, and that it was producing some great images that were really meaningful to them. But we learned a lot about how those images can be meaningful to us, how they could be inspirational, 
how they can, um, if nothing else, show us what our tax dollars are doing. That's very, very important too. So that lesson is definitely going to be carried forward with James Webb, I'm confident of that. With the hype that you've seen over the last couple of days, we are going to see more images. Will there be one of these events every week? No. Could there? That's what we're hearing that could happen with this telescope. We're, we're hearing that the kind of incredible deep images that we saw this week, that could happen absolutely every week. So we will continue to see images like this, but the, the images that the scientists are working with, they tend to be monochrome, they tend to be black and white, because they're looking at very specific wavelengths of light, they're looking for specific things. So you're gonna see a lot more, this isn't the last you're gonna see, uh, but there won't be another one of these tomorrow or next week, it might be a little bit after that, because the scientists are absolutely clamoring to, to get access to this. The time on this telescope is managed, and as it was with Hubble, you know, down to the second. It is such a good piece of software that they use to schedule this out uh, that has been repurposed for scheduling hospital operating rooms. You know, really important resources like that. So you know, that's, a, that's one of the spinoffs. Anything to add? All right, next question. What happens if you use radio waves on a telescope? Like you get that one. <laughs> uh, to look for radio waves, or to communicate with radio waves. But we have part of the electromagnetic spectrum is radio waves, and there's been at least one that I don't remember the name of space telescope. Anybody? Fermi. But I mean, it's just, it's one of those places on the electromagnetic spectrum uh, besides the visible range that we can see that you can look for things because there are objects in space that will radiate radio waves. And that may be the thing that they radiate more than anything else and stronger than anything else. So it would be to our advantage to use radio waves to look at that object. It may be just barely green, but we'll never see the green. But it may be like blah, 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 with radio waves and you can pick that up easier. Uh, but also we do communicate. Uh, NASA is working on laser communication between spacecraft and Earth, but right now we use the deep space network, the Goldstone and uh, Madrid, uh, Spain and Australia, like I was showing you, but that's how we communicate back and forth. Like I think they tell, they give orders on uh, what James Webb is supposed to do like twice a day, and then whenever those, uh, like Tony was talking about scheduling time, there's all kinds of scientists that want time to look through the telescope, but at the, our deep space network too, there's time for all these people, most of the spacecraft that are out there in the, by whatever country, we do the telemetry at our deep space network and there's a dry erase whiteboard that like, well, the European Space Agency wants us to say something to their spacecraft tomorrow at one, and then JPL will say, oh, no, 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 we're talking to the Mars rovers tomorrow at one, so you tell them some other time. And so there's competition for time to even communicate with our spaceships, much less what for them to do. Yeah, yeah very good question. So now Sorry. that you have the Webb telescope, what uses the Hubble telescope? That's a good question. It continues doing its thing. It is, uh, like everybody's mentioned here, it's focused in the visible spectrum. It was built for a different mission. It's looking at different things. So we will continue to use Hubble absolutely as long as we can. It is a machine. It will wear out at some point. It should have wore out a long time ago. So all those servicing missions that, that went up there, they weren't just correcting an initial problem or upgrading the cameras on board. They were also refueling it and, and uh, repairing uh, what are called reaction wheels. They, they rotate um, using electricity and that's what's used to point the telescope. So that was able to extend its life. We will continue using it as long as we can, but one of those last servicing missions also placed some rockets on board that will allow us to command it to uh, deorbit uh, in a place that we want. It'll be the, the South Pacific in an uh, uh, area that is very, very far from land. We will not do that until we absolutely have to. Hubble will continue to be used. And I also want to say with uh, regards to one of the questions that came up earlier about how many pictures or what we'll be able to get, I mean, Hubble is still active. We're well into 30 years of using Hubble. Um, 
and we're thinking hopefully 20 years with web. So, you know, again, Hubble has rewritten, um, you know, the textbooks as we know it. We can't even imagine what web's going to do. Um, so, how much days um, did it been? How much days did it been? How, like, like how much did it been a month? Like, how much, how much days did you build the um, microscope? So, how long did it take to build James Webb? I think that's that's a good question. Um, a very long time and multiple iterations. I don't have the exact figure, but. I mean, the initial the initial design was in the 90s. Um, I guess 2005, something like that. It started out on a cocktail napkin. It was a couple of of engineers. It was a couple of uh, astronomers that said, "Wouldn't it be nice if we could build a telescope this way?" And they were specifically building it for those infrared uh, wavelengths. So they could see what they wanted to see. But you might have seen it on some of the other broadcasts uh, discussing the telescope. It, it wasn't just NASA that built it. It was the European Space Agency, it was the Canadian Space Agency. We couldn't have built this telescope until just the past couple of years, just in the past you know, five to 10 years. We didn't have the technology to do it. So it took a long, long time, in part because we were waiting for the technology to catch up. And when you've got a couple of countries that are working together, that takes a little bit longer. Um, how did you get that precise point to put the web, to James Webb? It's rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm not making fun of your question, it's just, but it is, it's a lot of math and, and it's a very precise rocket and even, even as a rocket is going up off of the launch pad, if it's windier than you think it's going to be, that can push the rocket a little bit to one direction, and it's it's like um, uh, space flight. They they've said it it's, it starts out like um, golf, like you hit the ball and it kind of goes where you want to hit it, and then it ends up like uh, something else where you have to correct where it goes until it finally gets to where it's going. We have these uh, TCMs, trajectory correction maneuvers, where you've got onboard rocket engines that make these little corrections. So yeah, it's not just the launch rocket that gets most of its speed, but even to get out of Earth orbit, you've got to go 17,500 miles an hour. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's to get in orbit. To get out of orbit, it's 22,000. Thank you. It's 22,000 miles an hour. And when you're going that fast, the slightest little deviation, just just a millimeter is going to put you off course, and you're going to have to have rockets on board or reaction wheels, like uh, Tony mentioned, to change your orientation for when you fire the rocket to go a little bit different way. You have to make these constant corrections. But the launch vehicle for this was, did such a good job, such a precise job, that it nailed it closer than we expected. Good question. I've got the most unique comment question of all you previously spoke you said like before the big bang there was no light at all but if you could build a telescope that could see the big bang guess what you could possibly go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 which says, in the beginning there was God, and God created the heavens and the earth. And in order to do so, he created the Big Bang, which put them all in place. A possible theory, and it was good. And that also means the heavens declare the glory of God, which you also can find that at the Moorhead Planetarium. And then what that brings up after our lives pass on is heaven's grand universe trillions of times more spectacular than what the Hubble or the James Webb could see and that is for those who ask God and Jesus for your free advance only ticket to heaven before your life passes on unless you're a newborn child that's not accountable for sin or to Adam and Eve's big bad mistake which Run okay. all. 
<laughs> All right, you know, we are about out of time, so I'm going to get one question over here, and then we'll get one more question from YouTube. Thank you all. Hi. Um, so they, when they spoke on, um, what was it, WASP-96b, the planet there? So that's a gas giant, I'm guessing? Okay. So um, I'm in no way a space scientist. I just do Earth-type biology. So um, we see a lot of uh, tardigrades and cyanobacteria that, well, we know that cyanobacteria is a big part of what started life on our planet. And um, I was curious, they seem very certain that that is not the case there or on any of these other planets. And I think that's kind of, I mean, is, is it really there's no chance that there could be anything like that? Like. Uh, for 96B, it's just it's just so big. Uh, even though it's 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 uh, considerably less dense than Jupiter, it's also so close to its star, it's un it's unlikely. Uh, the spectroscopy we were doing so far was mainly looking for liquid water. Uh, you know, in the future with other spectroscopy, what can we look look at these other planets and see? We might see markers of other things. So we could look at other gases potentially, things like that. So, I think just kind of looking at the you know, there's a 50/50 chance. But the odds are kind of saying, well, it's so close to its star, it's probably not going to be. Yeah, it's 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 most likely too hot. Uh, it was a great because of the it's such a large uh, gas giant and it's so close to its star. It was an excellent first choice for testing all the instruments on board the James Webb, which is I really think why it was a target. Uh, will we go back and look at it again? You know, possibly it's within the field of view of Webb, so I don't see why we, we, we couldn't. Uh, but there's a lot more planets, I know, exoplanets, pardon me, that we're very interested in looking at. Um, and I know uh, exoplanets are a part of the James Webb mission, uh, but a lot more of looking for other signs of life would be actually in a future mission, I believe, if that's correct, uh, to say that. Uh, also, you're a te well, even if you're not a teacher, we have this great website called Eyes on Exoplanets that connects at uh, JPL in Pasadena. It's eyes, like your eyes, Oh, yeah, poke myself in the eyes. <laughs> Good thing I got my glasses on or I'd be blind now. Um, eyes.nasa.gov. And you go down to Eyes on Exoplanets, and it's the catalog, and you can go zoom in on the exoplanets and see an artist rendition of the solar system that they live in, and it will even have outlined the, uh, the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone, so you can see if it's right in there where we think probably is about the right temperature. And there's hundreds of them, most of them from the Kepler mission. But uh, you can go eyes.nasa.gov, eyes on exoplanets, and you can, it's constantly updated. Um, so there's hundreds and hundreds you can look at. And just one follow up on that. Um, I have to say the, that image uh, just of the spectra, so not even the image, the spectra uh, off of um, that particular star, that's what got me most excited. Um, when you could see you know, all those peaks, and you can start understanding, you know, chemically what's going on in that atmosphere. While granted, there's just, it's so close to its host star, there's so much radiation that's got to be bombarding um, that, that particular uh, gas giant. Odds are probably not the first place you're going to want to look for any signs of life. But the fact is the technology uh, is there, whether we uh, utilize it on web or on future missions, we can start to expand the search for life on other planets um, using this technology. So, you know, to me, I mean, you know, I, I got goosebumps trying to explain it to my wife earlier, so. <laughs> so we have a question from Mark. He wants to know if infrared and redshift, if they are related. It's the end result, but I will let, so yeah, I mean, you could have something that, let's say, you originally saw or was originally from that particular star or, you know, whatever deep space, deep space object. Uh, we started out in visible light, but as mentioned earlier, that light is traveling towards us, but at the same time, the universe is expanding in between it. So in that process over the you know, millennia that it takes to get to us, that red light is shifted. So if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you go from the visible, as you get a wider or longer wavelengths, it's being stretched, that's when you hit the infrared, is the kind of the next beneath the visible spectrum. There's a bumper sticker for sale at the uh, JPL gift shop. It's printed in red. 
and it says, if this bumper sticker looks blue, you're going too fast. <laughs> All right. Are we ending with a physics joke? We are. It's a Yay. perfect way to end. <laughs> So thank you so much, Mike, Tony, Alan, and Adam. And I also wanted to point out, if you did come, have come to Astronomy Days, virtual or in person, you would know Klaus and Stephanie from that NASA panel, because both have been speakers at Astronomy Days. So that was really exciting. And, um, and so thank you, all of you. This has been such a fun program. I want to thank all of our museum members. I know there are members out there tonight, because I've spoken to you. Thank you so much for supporting the museum. Your membership supports programs like this, so I appreciate it. And everyone have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thanks for sticking with us. I know we went over time.